Hey buddy. In my last video I talked about missing people's cases, and I mentioned that there are a handful of cases I think might have supernatural or extra natural explanations to them, like Bigfoot. And though some of you left comments that seemed to be relieved that I wasn't going to go down the Bigfoot route, I think some of them might be Bigfoot. <laughs> okay, so let me qualify this. I don't 100% believe in Bigfoot, but I think that if there's one abnormal conspiratorial thing that exists outside of our natural purview, aliens, ghosts, what have you, if you ask me which is the most likely to exist, it's gotta be Bigfoot. Now Bigfoot's a fun one, I think everybody loves Bigfoot, but it's not like there's a ton of evidence that proves that Bigfoot exists. So I thought debunking the concept of Bigfoot would be fun, and what better video to start with than the Patterson-Gimlin film? How hard could it be to debunk a video of a man in a gorilla suit? And despite the fact that it was filmed 60 years ago, and that it's the second most scrutinized piece of film in history, second only to the Zapruder film, the Patterson-Gimlin film has yet to be debunked. It has been determined beyond a shadow of a doubt that that film has never been altered or tampered with in any way. Whatever that was that they captured was a literal physical object that reflected the light from the sun into the camera lens. This is the single greatest piece of evidence for anything paranormal that exists today on Earth. Period. And the thing is, I might have just stopped there. I can't disprove it, I can't prove it, but then I started to look into the biographies and the goings on of all the people involved in the making of this film. It's kind of obscure about the timeline of how it was filmed and developed, and the fact that we don't know where it was developed or by whom, regardless of whether or not the Sasquatch actually is real. All of the drama surrounding this story is as interesting as the film itself. And if Patterson and Gimlin did in fact catch a real Sasquatch, then these brief few seconds of film took nothing less than a relentless series of miracles to be recorded. But before we get started, today's video is brought to you by you! I want to give a huge thank you to all of my patrons, and especially thank you for sticking with me through all of this pandemic nonsense. I know things are not easy for everybody. If you love the channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, please consider visiting my merch store. I'll be releasing fun new designs every month. And if you really want to support the channel, the best way is to like, comment, and subscribe. In 1967, documentary filmmaker Roger Patterson invited his friend Bob Gimlin to help him film B-roll in Bluff Creek, Northern California. They had taken with them a rented film camera along with several reels of 16mm film. Throughout their stay, they had changed camping locations almost daily. They had taken with them three horses they were using in the film as well as to travel around the Great Wilderness. On the 20th day of their trip, they were taking footage of Bob Gimlin with a pack mule. They had ridden their horses down into a valley that had just been cleared out by floodwaters the season before. There were rocks and tree debris scattered everywhere, making it somewhat difficult to tell exactly what would be down there. They had only just entered the valley when from behind a tree stump only 15 meters away appeared an eight foot tall ape-like creature. The horses all reared at once. Bob Gimlin, a seasoned rider, was able to stay on his horse, whereas Roger Patterson's horse rolled over onto his leg. Adrenaline running, Bob Gimlin rides his horses further away to get a safer view of the creature. Roger Patterson famously scrambles to grab his camera. Accidentally set to the wrong frame rate, Patterson runs up and aims the camera at the creature. By this point, it's at least 30 meters away. The two gentlemen had been filming all afternoon. There were only a couple of minutes of film left. Patterson's heart is pounding. He's breathing heavy. He manages to steady the camera for only a moment, and that's when we get it. The greatest seconds of film in history. <laughs>
It's really important that you think for yourself. Duh, right? The thing is, I had fallen into this trap of believing that I was obligated to produce all the answers and that my videos had to be as comprehensive as humanly possible. And I do have a lot of answers, but I don't have all the answers. And with this subject, it would be entirely impossible. But also, it's kind of stupid for me to give you an answer on whether or not this is a real Bigfoot. Because if the armored skeptic tells you that Bigfoot doesn't exist, and you see a Bigfoot, does that mean what you're seeing isn't real? We've all seen the Patterson-Gimlin film, but when I was studying it, I really wanted to be able to find obvious tells that it was fake. I have a lot of experience with costuming and film acting, and I thought for sure I'd be able to find a seam or a zipper, or some sort of an awkward movement that only a man in a rubber mask would make. So at first, I grabbed the original footage, and after a few hours of watching it over and over again, I really didn't get the impression that it was just a man in a gorilla suit, and that really shocked me. So then I had to find a stabilized version, then I had to find a high-definition version, then I found individual frames that were blown up and restored into crisp, glorious images, then I watched a bunch of different video analyses breaking down all of the movements of the animal and how the film itself was created. So the first question is, what the hell were two adult men doing in the middle of the woods with a camera? in 1967. Well, it turns out the reason they were out there was to film a documentary about Bigfoot. See, when I heard that, my bullshit meter went off. Like, of course they would fake seeing a Bigfoot if they're making a documentary trying to prove that Bigfoot exists, right? But even though that sounds like a giant red flag, after learning the story, it turns out that it makes total sense that two men that were looking for Bigfoot would be the two men to find Bigfoot. Roger Patterson was a Bigfoot enthusiast. He had written a book about Bigfoot called Abominable Snowmen, and he was in the middle of filming a documentary about a famous Bigfoot encounter. Only a few weeks before that, he and Bob Gimlin had done an expedition to Mount St. Helens, looking for possible Bigfoots in the lava tubes and cave systems in the area. While they were up there, Don Abbott, Rene DeHinden, and John Green were researching a set of between 500 and 1,000 Bigfoot footprints that were found in Bluff Creek, Northern California. When Roger Patterson returned home from Mount St. Helens, his wife had informed him of the find in Bluff Creek. So he called up Bob Gimlin, who had still not yet sat down in his favorite chair at home, and they started to plan their trip to Bluff Creek. Patterson's friends considered him kind of a huckster, not a totally reliable man. But not many people said that he was a liar, like he was the kind of person that would try to hoax something out of his love for it. See, it wasn't a very normal thing for somebody to have a camera, let alone take weeks off of work to spend them in the woods filming Bigfoot and his best buddy in a cowboy hat and a wig. But in the same breath, you can say it's not ordinary people who tend to do extraordinary things. It's the eccentrics, the strange, the weird, and out there that help us find things to open our minds to new possibilities. And Roger didn't actually own the camera, he had rented it. And that alone is expensive. In those days, you weren't going to just rent a camera and not use it. They never expected to actually come across a real Bigfoot in the flesh. They thought that they were just going to find more footprints. They wanted to film Bigfoot footprints. But to Roger's dismay, a construction crew had wiped them clean from the dirt road that they were printed on. Frustrated, they started to do a systematic search of the park, hoping to find more footprints. And only three miles away from the original footprint site is where they ran into Patty, the Sasquatch. I used to really hate Sasquatch footprints. They just seemed really fake to me. They were too symmetrical, too flat, the toes were too perfect. It just seemed like something a kid would make. Everybody just stuck with this design because that's the fake footprint design that they came up with in like the Victorian era or whatever. And I mean, hoaxsters like to stay consistent with each other. It makes them more believable if they are all using the same lies. You don't want to be that one hoaxster that comes out and is like, actually, Bigfoot is purple. But now, these footprints make total sense to me. This is exactly 
what a Sasquatch footprint should look like. As stupid as that sounds. The first hint is that we can find humans that make similar flat-footed prints. Other animals, when they walk or run, it's much more rhythmic and planned. But humans, we kind of do this weird dance where we hop into the air and twist our hips around. And when I looked at Sasquatch prints, I was expecting to see the same thing. And when I didn't, I just assumed that somebody was stamping them into the ground. And I always assumed that if Sasquatch existed, that they would belong to the homo group. However, based on the way that Patty walks, her hips don't twist and her legs don't dance around each other. And when she's at full speed, at least one foot is always firmly planted on the ground. Patty's legs are lifting and shuffling straight forward, more like a locomotive on rails. And with this walk, that is exactly how they would leave footprints like that. And believe it or not, it was only just recently that biologists really figured out the way that our feet work. Biologists assumed that it was the longitudinal arch that allows humans to walk on two feet. And because Bigfoot footprints only have a transverse arch, they assumed, like I did, that they were fake and that no animal could walk on two feet with only transverse arches. However, it turns out that our transverse arch is what allows us to walk on two feet, and that our longitudinal arch is what allows us to run and walk on our tippy toes. A bipedal creature absolutely could have feet that look like this. And what's really amazing is that after they filmed Patty, they invited those same researchers back to Bluff Creek, and the footprints that Patty left matched one of the sets from the earlier finds months before, only three miles away. Way. Somebody posted this claiming that it was the print of a baby Sasquatch. Now I'm not going to pretend that I think that it is. And if you look at the Patterson-Gimlin film, you can clearly see that the palms of her hands are dark, but the bottoms of her feet are much, much lighter. Some people were using that as evidence that this was not in fact a hominid or an ape, but if a Sasquatch's foot starts like this and ends like this, then the lighter color of the foot can be explained by simple callousing. One of the reasons I hated the footprints so much is because they were so amorphous and blobby like a big potato. But if Sasquatch is living in some of the roughest terrain around the world, like the Rockies, and they're walking, the way that they walk, then you can absolutely expect their feet to callous. I actually remember this pretty vividly from when I was younger. Bob Hieronymus making his rounds on national television, being tested on his involvement in the Patterson-Gimlin film. The group had hired a costume designer from California to make them up a Sasquatch suit. And when the two gentlemen arrived in the valley, he was directed to walk out in front of them and out into the tree line. Of course, the mainstream media ate this up, but you guys know I don't trust them. You're telling me that that wasn't Sasquatch, that wasn't Bigfoot, that was you in a costume. That was me in a costume in 1967 in the Roger Patterson Bigfoot film, yes. I put it on like a, like a football helmet, and um, I walked back and forth the way he wanted me to walk. The, the Bigfoot walk, and uh, he said, that's perfect, that's just what we want. He had supposedly passed a polygraph test? Bob, the lie detector has determined. Bob, you're telling the truth. Well, I always knew it was the truth. Everybody that I'm associated with, I've been around, knew it was the truth. Yeah, seems pretty legit. But what's amazing is even the guy that claimed to design the costume was also on tour for several years telling this story. Bob Hieronymus, who wore the suit, has one glass eye. When you see him walking through the forest, you only see this side. Because Patterson told him, tomorrow when we shoot this, I want you to bring along an extra glass eye. And they place the eye in here. So as he's walking, he turns this way, and you see the eye. Active in the motion picture industry since 1939 as an impersonator of animals of the ape family, Mr. Prohaska was convinced that Roger Patterson had filmed a living wild creature. The movement is the only thing that throwed me a little bad, because he moved a little bit more than a man, more like a man than an animal. Because you could see all the muscles on the body and the whole movement. It didn't move like a costume at all. And the size of it was enormous big size, so I don't know if they find a big man like that. Do you think it would be possible to create such a costume? Uh, that would be a difficult... I don't think so. 
because that costume, if this would be a costume that would have taken such a long time to put the, the hair, you should put the hair by glue, glue on. It would take about 10 hours, the whole makeup job. And it looked to me very, very real. I'm doing now this since 1939. And uh, if that was a costume, that was the best I have ever seen. I don't think that I need to make a case for how this isn't what we see in the video. I think that's pretty obvious. But the designer says that this is an exact recreation of the suit that he made in 1967. Miraculously, there are several frames in the film where you can see Patty's feet. And in one of the frames, right before it hits the ground, the toes are articulated up. And then when the foot hits the ground, the toes go down. Bob Hieronymus has never given an answer for how they achieved that. Achieving this level of sophistication in 1967 would have been extremely difficult. This Sasquatch is named Patty after Patty Patterson's wife, Patricia, and they can tell it's a woman. It has very large, impossible to ignore <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Patty. And this is something that most people didn't notice until the 90s and early 2000s when better quality versions of the film came out. But at one point in the film, Patty turns around, and as she does that, she knocks one of her boobs up just one. And for two frames, one of the boobs is a uniform with the other, and then it flops back down. Just one. But the suit that they show us... The director came to me just before we were ready to shoot on National Geographic. He said, when Bigfoot walks through the forest, do the boobs bounce? I said, what? What are you talking about? I said, you are crazy. I said, first of all, I made that suit, and I made this suit, and the boobs don't bounce on either suit. Now, I want you to notice this material and how it's made. This has a stretch in it that stretches actually in different directions. So as he was walking through the forest with that extra weight on there, the boobs bounced. <laughs> the first time I'd ever noticed that. I'm sorry, but that does not explain what we see in the film. But it doesn't really matter. We can argue all day about whether or not this suit is the suit that we see in the film, but that doesn't mean that what we see in the film has to be a real Sasquatch. But there are a ton of other signs that this might be a real Sasquatch. The fur pattern is perfect. It's symmetrical. There are no seams, creases, zippers, folds anywhere on the suit. There's no indication that there's a break between the fur on the head and the fur on the back. Patty quite confidently turns all the way around and whips her head back. And at no point do any folds or creases flip up. In fact, in general, Patty's movements are way too confident. A man in a gorilla suit, even a seasoned animal actor, would have probably stumbled after making a movement like that, or at least would have had to have looked straight down to get his bearings. And the last thing is that she covers way too much ground, way too quickly. Now it's sort of hard to tell exactly how fast she's going. Like I said, the frame rate was accidentally on the wrong setting on the camera. They think it was somewhere between 14 and 16 frames per second. And if that's the case, and if Patty actually is between seven and eight feet tall, when she's at full stride, even though it looks like she's walking, she's traveling the average jogging speed of a fit human being. In fact, according to Patterson, he chased after the Bigfoot, but couldn't keep up with it after it passed the tree line. The muscles under her shoulder move, and when she stomps, the tendons in her right leg shake. The one thing that the costume designer did explain about the suit that sort of makes sense, they say that Bob was wearing football pads and that is what simulated the muscle look. So really, the last thing there is to be skeptical about are the two men that were there filming it. Roger Patterson, the man holding the camera itself, died of cancer in the 70s. And if you asked 100 people their opinion of him, they'd give you 100 different answers. Another point that this film is probably real is that Roger Patterson never really made any money 
off of it. But Roger never sold it to anyone. When his story started to gain traction, a bunch of his friends and family just came out of the woodwork demanding their cut from money that he didn't even have. The most famous of which is Bob Hieronymus, claiming that Roger Patterson owed him over $800. And though he seemed like the kind of man that had the ability and the motive to pull off a hoax like this, the kind of man that would borrow money from you, promise to pay it back, but just never would, the words from his own friends. But those same friends also said that he loved Sasquatch so much and that he didn't seem like the kind of guy that would want to lie like this. So I mean, you just have to ask the question yourself. Can somebody love Sasquatch so much and they want everybody else to believe in it so much that they're willing to lie. Obviously, we can't ask Roger. However, we can look to Bob. Bob has hated dealing with the press, would hang up on reporters, would refuse interviews. Bob claimed that people would harass him at his home, yet he maintained from day one that what he saw that day was real. And honestly, Bob Gimlin doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would want to lie like this. He's legitimately one of those old school cowboy types who was a man of his word. Bob Gimlin wasn't there to prove Sasquatch was real. Bob Gimlin was there to ride horses with his friend in the woods because that's what Bob Gimlin likes. And in 1967, the kind of behavior that Bob Gimlin and Roger Patterson were displaying in the woods was not considered cool. Now it's bad enough that he's getting all this attention for being this famous Bigfoot sighter and that his wife is perpetually angry with him from all the attention that he's getting for being a huge embarrassment to the family. But now the whole world knows that he likes to dress up and play cowboy in the woods with a camera, which is like the equivalent of LARPing. And it's only really been the last five years or so that he's sort of gotten over the stigma of it as more and more people believe in Bigfoot and invite him to come speak at their conferences. You know, it kind of makes me happy seeing Bob happy, enjoying the limelight, getting to finally live down the shame from all those years ago. And he's met with adoring fans everywhere he goes. I'd love to meet him and have a beer with him. And considering the man is like 90 years old, He's looking amazing. And really, I can sit here and list all the problems that I have with the film. The fact that it's filmed exactly how I would film a hoax film with shaky cam, grainy film, with the wrong frame rate from too far away. And the last few seconds of reel, by the way, as an excuse to not have footage of you chasing after it. The fact that the timeline is really messy from when they filmed it to when they developed it to when they released it. The fact that Bob Hieronymus is up their ass about it, saying that he was there, he was the one in the suit. But it doesn't matter. You could prove tomorrow that Roger Patterson wanted to hoax a Bigfoot video, that Bob Hieronymus was physically there in a Bigfoot suit, that Bob Gimlin lied for the first time in his entire life, that an entire Hollywood film crew was there. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't change the fact that what you see in this film is impossible to explain. I think this is a Bigfoot. Oh my God. Am I okay? The Patterson-Gimlin film, shot on 16 millimeter film, realistically could be blown up to 2K or 4K resolution. And if we could do that, we would be able to see clear as day whether or not Patty is a real Sasquatch. However, nobody currently has possession of the film. It has been held up in legal disputes for the better part of 50 years. It's only part owned by Roger Patterson's widow. And Bob Gimlin signed over his rights to the film because he was getting sick of all of the attention. Wouldn't it be cool if we could start some sort of a campaign to actually get our hands on that film? Let's just take a moment to listen to Bob recounting those fateful moments on that beautiful Friday afternoon. I'm not out here to prove to anybody that they exist at all. I said, I know they exist. Is there a question whether you could have been fooled? I said, no way. 
No way. Well, we were away. We were 36 miles back in the woods. And the closest thing to us was guys, they were up way on up on the side of the mountain uh, with a bulldozer and road graders. And I don't even know if they were even anybody up there on a Saturday. N no, it was a Friday, Bob. This was on a Saturday afternoon, October 20th, 1967. Fuck! I knew there was something wrong with the timeline.